it's always beneficial to go into the presence of God. Am I right? I got to hold. I got to pause on this. If you're able to stand, I want you to be aware uh, that the Apostles' Creed has been around uh, for a lot of years, <laughs> several thousands of years. This is the crux of what the church was built on. And I, and I need you to know and understand that there are people that are attempting to tell you that this is not something they are willingly going to follow anymore. They don't believe it. So I pray that as you recite these words, if you do, in fact, recite these words, that you believe them and you're willing to act upon them. Join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, church. If you're willing to, you can stay, remain standing for the reading of Scripture. Again, you don't have to. If you need to sit, you can. God will speak to you sitting. Luke 14 is where we're at today. And I'm going to read to you verses 7 through 14. It literally says, at the, the, the headline in, in my, my Bible here says, Jesus teaches about humility. <laughs> when Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat, and then you'll be embarrassed, and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. And then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. And then you'll be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God indeed. You may be seated. Well, church, how was your week? Busy? Exciting? Hot? Cold? I'm getting a thumbs up over here, Sadie. That's good. First week of school wasn't too bad? No? No? All right? Good? Hopefully it's going good. Hopefully whatever you faced this week, you didn't shrink at its weight. You didn't fall back and, and lose sight of who's really in charge. We know because we've been doing this for eight months now. Next Sunday, we'll start our ninth month. Eight months. I've been t telling you every week, how was your worship? I'm not talking about Sunday morning worship, but I'm talking about everyday worship. Include him. He's, value, he's worthy of our worship, right? How was our time of prayer? Did we have time to reflect? Is, are we doing what it is that God wants us to do? Are we staying in touch with him? Is he changing our mind about something? Can we study him? What did we study about? Did we learn anything about God that we didn't know before? Then how on earth can we take all of that stuff and make it about serving other people and sharing the good news with them. I'm excited about next month already because we're going to talk about evangelism. And I know it's a, it's a rough word when you say it to people, but it's not what you think. 
It's not standing on a street corner. We're going to talk about how that combines all of this together. But for now, we got one more week of things Jesus taught. It's been really weird, has it not? Like this, this lectionary, te- I, these came out of the lectionary. I did not choose these texts. These came from a, a preset list that, that is ordained and, and done years in advance. Four strange, very strange teachings of Jesus. Some that we don't really ever hear a lot. He talked about being ready that first week. No matter what happens, be ready. Keep, your, keep, your, keep the home fires burning is what I said, if you remember right. Keep the home fires burning because you never know. And then he talked about what it, what it meant to, to take that information and yet realize that when you're in Jesus, there's going to be separation because some people aren't going to follow him the way you do. And that's okay. It's okay. And yet in that division and in that separation, we still need to love people because that love might be what, what borders the gap between who they are and what they believe and who you are and what you believe. The grace and love might be the difference. And then last week, we talked about Jesus willing to heal a woman in the the synagogue on the Sabbath and what that meant to turn that idea or that mindset and that concept around of who God is and how he can work outside of laws and things that we've preconceived are set in stone. He can work outside of those ways. Now today, we see him doing something very similar and yet something different. Now, if you want to understand the context of what it is that we're talking about, go back to Luke 14, verse 1. It's where this whole setting starts. And it says, on the Sab- one Sabbath day, we're on the Sabbath again. This is all happening on, on a Sabbath day. Jesus went to eat at, eat, eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees, and the people were watching him closely. I don't know about you, but if I was Jesus, I don't think I would be comfortable eating dinner at the home of a Pharisee. They've obviously already been challenging him and pushing him and, and telling people don't follow him. We saw the synagogue leader last week have trouble addressing Jesus. He didn't address Jesus, did he? He in turn goes to the crowd and he addressed the crowd and tried to make them feel bad about this healing that took place. And so when you get backwards and you see what happens, Jesus eating dinner on the Sabbath at a a Pharisee's house. Obviously there's lots of people there. They all wanna see Jesus. Many of them wanna catch him and, and make fun of him. But there was a man there whose arms and legs were swollen. And Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the religious law, is it permitted in the law to heal people on the Sabbath day or not? Right in their face. (coughs) They didn't answer him. They had no answer. Jesus touched the sick man and healed him and sent him away. And then he turned to them and said, which of you doesn't do work on the Sabbath? If your son or your cow falls into a pit, would you not rush to get him out? And again, they refused to answer. You understand that, and and this goes back to the division part. You understand that when you claim to be a follower of Jesus, you are close to him. You do follow him. You are praying. You are in tight there are going to be people that will challenge you, but not Jesus. They cannot touch him. They cannot do anything to him or any, have any power over him. They cannot, but they can change your mind. They can make you feel bad. They can make you feel stressed out. They can make you feel bad. They cannot address Jesus. He is the ultimate power in this earth. He bled and died. He was a real person. And we have to believe that he is because that's where the power comes from. That's where our strength and our hope come from. If there was no Jesus, if Jesus is not who he said he was, this is all useless. And you've heard me say that here before. It's all pointless. It's moot. We're just going through motions of stuff. 
But it's when we dig deeper, it's when we go deeper with Jesus, we find out how real he really is. And he means something to our life. Jesus picks right up where he left off last week. If you remember, and I think it was, it was in Luke, I don't remember the actual chapter and verse, I already had moved on and I'm already even planning September, so I don't remember that. But he did the healing in, this, in, this, in the synagogue. Now he's placed himself, not in a synagogue, but right in the house of the Pharisees. He's gone right into the lion's den on the Sabbath and healed again. Now I know this isn't Jesus' style, but I have this feeling that Jesus is like, nah, 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 nah. my dad's tougher than your dad. Right? Watch this. You thought it was bad last week when I was in the synagogue. We're all sitting around the table eating together, which was a very important moment in their time. And he goes, watch this. Boop. I'm going to heal the guy with the swollen arms and legs. Oh, no. What are you going to do about it? And they won't answer him. What are you going to do about it? You got no power. You got no strength. I am who I say I am. I'm the son of the living God. I'm carrying with me 100% God and 100% human. And there's not a thing you can do about it, except believe it or not. And when you believe it, there's power. And it moves us. In verses uh, 7 through 11, Jesus utilizes then in this presence of these people, a very common occurrence. The wedding feast was a big deal. A lot of times a wedding brought together two very powerful families. It was, it was a lot of times prearranged. A lot of times you, you, you did it to gather territories, land, stock, livestock. All those things were, got, this, this was a big deal. A big deal to have two families come together and this feast would go on for days. And so he talks about the importance of the wedding feast. Never mind that he's gonna talk later about The importance of Jesus, the bride, coming for his groom, the church, right? This is going to be incredible. But he uses the wedding feast because they understand it and they know it. They've practiced it. If they are people who are following the law, oh, they know about the wedding feast. They know how that works. We don't really so much know how that Jewish wedding feast worked, at least back in that time. So imagine yourself a current uh, wedding reception. Uh, How many of you have been to a wedding recently? Last month or so, you went to a a wedding reception. Correct me if I'm wrong, you're welcome to. Usually there is a head table and it's the bride and the groom, these two people that are getting married, they're in the place of honor, ahead of everybody. You can usually see them. I know some settings even put them up on a stage kind of. Right? So everybody can see them. And then they have their wedding party with them, the the, the people that are standing with them and and witnessing to their love and grace for each other. And then you even have certain tables then that are reserved because that's where family and friends, they go. They go to those important places. And then you kind of have everybody else. Generally speaking, I've been to weddings where they were like, we don't care, sit wherever you want. So I've, I've been to it both ways. But in that vision, Think of a wedding reception. Now imagine you are so self-absorbed, you are so important that you walk into the wedding reception and you plop yourself down in the groom or bride's chair. Grab your napkin, you tuck it in, your your collar, right? And you grab the fork and knife and you're ready. Like, come on, I'm important. That'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Now, can you imagine when the, Bride or groom has to come up and go, uh, excuse me, <laughs> I'm not sure what you're doing, but that's my seat. You're going to have to go sit there. Now imagine how that is em- going, would be embarrassing in front of everybody. They're going to tell you that that's not your seat and they're going to make you move. That's what Jesus is trying to get the point across. It's always easier on us as followers of Jesus if we put ourselves at the back of the line first. Let everybody get their their fake glory. Let everybody get their earthly reward. It's okay. It's not that important. What's important is that Jesus is first. 
The world can have the world. It's not going to be around forever. Firm believer of that. Right? 10 out of 10 people are going to die. We know that too, right? What are, we wait, what are we trying to get honored for here? If we know for a fact that there is a, and, and believe that there is another life after this one, and that's what we're striving for, then it should, in this moment, put us at the bottom of the list. And we should be putting our family first, our friends first, our community first, and then whether or not we have anything that we like should be coming last. Because does it really matter? Does it really matter what we want? Not really. In the grand scheme of things, it's not. It's not that important. And Jesus even says that for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And yet those who humble themselves will be exalted. If there was anybody who had the power to walk into a room and sit at the head of the table, it was this guy. He's the only person who was 100% human and 100% God. He was incarnate God. Jesus was. If anybody had a reason to view their importance higher than, than expected, he could. And yet, even when tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he doesn't even test God. He's like, nope, I'm just a guy. I'll give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. He goes, nah, I'm good. Psst, hey, devil, this is all designed to burn anyway. I don't need this stuff. Right? And so when he goes into a room, he's not the most important person in the room. He doesn't have to be. I, I was talking earlier about um, the, the disciples arguing in the upper room. At the Last Supper, they're arguing about who's the most important and who's the most relevant and who gets to sit at his right hand. And he's like, oh, man, I sure wish I wasn't dying tomorrow because you guys still don't get it. You don't get it. It's not about who's sitting at my right hand. You're all going to be at my right hand, hopefully, if you do this right, if you follow me. Jesus always has a way of helping us understand humility. He was so humble that he saw you. He understood who you were going to be. He understood the decisions that you were going to make. He understood your mistakes. He understood your failures. He understood your sin. And yet he never let that be a factor in whether or not he was willing to give up his life for you on a cross. That's humility. Jesus never indicated that he was the greatest. Simply put, I am indeed the son of God, or in many cases, I am who you say I am. Never once divulging that he was better, never once divulging that he was greater, never mentioning, I deserve, I deserve. He knew who he was, and he didn't need anyone's validation to prove it. We do not need to be the center of attention, and we do not need anyone's exaltation of us to be a validation of who we are. I'm a pastor. It would be very easy for me to fall into the trap that many have. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I love it when you tell me, Pastor, that spoke to me today. Pastor, you did a really good job today. Because for every, every one of those, I get a hundred, man, you really should have done this. Or I wish this would have happened. Or you could do this better. Or you see where I'm going with that? I was once told that a pat on the back is only about six inches from a kick in the rear. So take those pats on the back, agree with them, and be like them because you never know when it's going to drop six inches and you need a kick in the rear. Humility comes when we understand that it's not about us. And I feel like the church as a whole, the organized church as a whole, has really failed the followers of Jesus Christ, the believers who are not called to ministry like this. I feel that they failed you for about the last century. Because they've been taught in seminary that they are important. They have been taught that they are the head. They have been taught that they are the leader, that you have to listen to them, that they make the rules and that you got to follow them. And I'm here to tell you, church, that's not true. I am called because God called me because I am gifted at teaching, equipping, and empowering. That's what he called me to. 
He called me to, and I ran from it, and I hid from it. I hid from it for 25 years before I finally said, okay, I'm going to humble myself, and I'm going to say, listen, you were right. I was wrong. I tried my way, and it didn't work, and so now I'm just going to follow you, and I really wish there's parts of me and days that I wish, and Stephen, I just talked about this. There's days I wish I wouldn't have said yes. <laughs> this is not my chosen profession. I had a lucrative job. I walked away from it. Why? Because I thought being obedient to God was more important than money. Sorry, Jill. Sorry about that. She agreed with me, though. He takes care of us, though. We, we, do, we do. I have no idea how his math works, but I like it better than mine. It works. Because we're willing to just be there, to follow, to be in whatever he needs us to be. Now, he's not asking every one of you to, to leave your job and to go into ministry. But what he's asking you to do is wherever you are, to follow him, humble yourself, and realize you are in ministry every day of your life. You are a bearer of the good news. You are an image bearer of God. And he is asking you to follow him and then share that good news with people. Place yourself a little bit lower and just start serving people. It's incredibly humbling, and yet it's also empowering. The Apostle Paul says this about humility. And we know if you go through Paul's history, you know that he was a Pharisee. He uh, murdered and imprisoned Christians that followed Jesus because he thought he was wrong. Uh, and then was changed. He had a, an experience with the risen Christ on Damascus Road that changed his life. And so when he says these words, it means something. In Ephesians 3, verses 8 through 9, he said, Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. Paul does not diminish God's authority and yet diminishes his own power and his ability to reach people and teach people. Now, some of you, us, some of us uh, can take our humility too far to the point where we're constantly telling ourselves that we're not good at anything. Uh, we're not really gifted. He hasn't given me any gifts. He doesn't need me for anything, and I really don't have a whole lot of value. And the more we tell ourselves that, the more we realize that we're demeaning ourselves and we're devaluing our, our position within God's great plan and universe. And I want you to hear this message today, if that's you. God wants you to know that you are a child of his, not because of your goodness and your great deeds, but because of his son, Jesus, sacrificing his life for you, giving up his life on a cross, that is his stamp of approval that no matter who you are, no matter what you feel you're gifted at or not, no matter how good or bad you see yourself, he loves you. And he wants you to understand that you are a part of his good news story to the world. You're valuable and you're important. Even the mess that you are, you're valuable and important. Jesus closes in th this set of verses today uh, in verses 12 through 14. And he's making sure that the person whose house he went to, this Pharisee, and it says that he points his, this, his, this closing comment is pointed at him. He says, he turns to the, to the, to the household leader and he says... Stop inviting your friends and your rich neighbors and your family members. Because all they're going to do is invite you back for, to, for dinner to their house. And guess what? That's your reward. And it's not going to go any farther than that. Who you need to invite, who you need to bring in your presence. You need to bring the poor. You need to bring the crippled. You need to bring the lame. And you need to bring the blind. Because they can't pay you back and they don't deserve it. And your reward is not going to be here because there are no real rewards here on this earth. 
your reward's going to be in heaven. We should not be working towards earthly rewards. We should not be working to making sure that, that our bank account's fat enough or that our bellies are fat enough. We should be working towards things that are eternal and things that hold eternal value. That's humility. How can today's example of Jesus' humility bring us to a place where we understand our position? Other people are more important. God is our only hope, and he's our source of strength. Jesus has a calling for each one of us. Everyone has a purpose. Everyone has a place. Jesus does not just call randomly. He calls everyone. Whether or not you're listening is completely up to you. He will let you not listen. Trust me. 25 years, I know what that looks like. Every one of us is called to a higher place and a higher purpose. And each one of us holds a gift that God is attempting to unwrap and unleash on the world. And as sooner we all understand that this power, the Holy Spirit, holds for us and holds within us, the sooner we can unleash that on the world and God will be present. How can we eliminate our pride? How can we eliminate our fear? How can we eliminate our doubt and allow God to follow the Spirit's leading and open up those parts of us that the world might get to see this amazing gift that he's intended us to be? Amen. I was looking for a great story to go along with this. You know, I wanted to find that great benediction humility story. And I found it in Scripture. Not in a, an assuming place. How many of us know or realize who King Solomon was? King Solomon was the wisest of the kings that God had placed in, in the land. He had everything that he needed. He had all the money. He had all the property. He had all the livestock. He had everything, including this grand wisdom. And so in his time with God, one night in Second Chronicles 7, verses 12 four, through 14, this is what God imparts to Solomon. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as a place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and restore their land. How hard would that have been for a guy who has everything, who knows everything, who doesn't need anything? That there's things that you aren't going to control. And when you're faced with trouble, you need to be humble and seek my face. And turn from your ways because that's when I'm going to listen. Church, I hope that you have a great rest of your week. And I look forward to talking about evangelism next week. I'm super excited. Have a great week.